uh, how do you answer? Is there one religious or Christian religious morality? Uh, factually, there's definitely not just one. Um, there's 2,000 years of, of evidence to show that we've been arguing about these questions from the beginning. Um, uh, some early arguments had to do with uh, gender roles and uh, the, the um, handling of economic life. Are we allowed to have personal property or are we supposed to share it? Um, how much are we supposed to give and how, right? Um, the question of violence surfaced pretty early. Are we allowed to retaliate if we are wronged? Um, a relationship to the state under the Roman Empire was an issue from the beginning. Um, you know, so um, yes, I would say, say sexuality. Um, are we allowed to get married? Uh, you know, what are the rules for marriage? Uh, are we allowed to get divorced? That's even in the New Testament, you can see they were arguing about the legitimacy of divorce. You can see it already in the text. Um, so, so then picture a church that is divided into three main groups, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Protestant, and then think of all the different Protestant groups. And then think of 2000 years of arguments within each individual tradition, as well as across the traditions. Um, one way to teach any ethical um, field or any ethical um, conversation is to talk about communities arguing within themselves over time. I do think you can see some broad lines of tradition and even consensus, mainly set by the towering example of Jesus. But that consensus, and you have to teach that, you have to talk about that, but, but there's lots and lots of arguments too, and lots of failures, because you can develop standards and then not live up to your own standards. You know, I, I'm sure, I know you are, but I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, work of R. Marie Griffith at Washington University and uh, in, yeah. in her book, Moral Combat. And then of course, um, Molly Worthen uh, in her book, Apostles of Reason, David, it seems, you know, fast forwarding to the 20th century, you know, really looking at American evangelicalism the last 100 years, specifically in ethics and morality, it seems on some major moral issues that society had adopted that American, whether it was fundamentalism in the early part of the century and then post-1940 on American evangelicalism, it was always late to the party on moral issues when it came to civil rights, race, interracial marriage, birth control, immigration, reproductive rights, gun control, LGBT issues. Why? Why, why have relatively uh, modern evangelicals, 100 years or so, why have, why have they been late to what society has adopted as a moral ethic? Yeah. Um, it wasn't everybody uh, in evangelicalism. There, there was, not as much now, but there was a center and a left in evangelicalism. And, I mean, I worked with one of the, actually two of the icons of the left wing of evangelicalism in Jim Wallace and Ron Sider. So if, if anybody listening knows those names, they know of... By the way, does Jim Wallace, yeah. does Jim Wallace still consider himself an evangelical? Uh, probably not. Right. But, no. but cer Ron Sider, certainly in the... Sider course. did. To, okay. Mm -hmm, yeah, Sider did to the day he died. Mm -hmm. um, he was a Canadian Mennonite evangelical. So he was a pacifist. Mm -hmm egalitarian, simple living. He wrote Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger in the 70s, the book that really changed the conversation. So he was challenging American consumerism and capitalism. Um, uh, he was an environmentalist. He was deeply committed to racial justice. And he was a, he was a, a deeply committed evangelical. So, so there were voices like that, but they were largely drowned out or defeated in moral combat by um, by the right-wing types um, who
who in general took a conservative or even reactionary posture on every issue that you named. Um, and there's other ones too. Uh, and so my book on democracy, defending democracy from its Christian enemies that came out in October is really about how it is that certain parts of the Christian community just position themselves as reactionary, negative reactionaries to, to every social change. And that this is not a healthy ethics or politics. And you can see it from the from the 60s forward once our our society divided over progressive social change and most evangelicals and the evangelical power structure generally took the conservative posture on everything so go back to the 60s civil rights movement you know you had foot dragging or outright opposition from most evangelicals white evangelicals um uh the feminist movement, you had a lot of anti-feminism in evangelicalism, a deep opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment and just in general to women in women's liberation, women in the workplace. Um, of course, the gay rights movement has been resolutely opposed by evangelicals from the beginning. Immigration, now that's an issue where there's plenty of biblical evidence for why we should look at every person as precious made in the image of God and xenophobia should have nothing to do with Christianity, but it got into the marrow of a lot of right-wing Christianity. Um, uh, the uh, prayer in schools decision, I think it was 1962 by the Supreme Court, you had evangelicals and still have evangelicals who want a more of a Christian establishment in, in public life. Um, so yes, the outside world looking in would say, Oh, the evangelicals, they're the ones who are against every inclusive social change. Um, I should mention, by the way, I used to work a lot on the torture issue after 9-11 when the U.S. started torturing people. Right. I, was in, I, I led a movement uh, against that. We did some polling once, and we found, no surprise, that the most pro-torture religious community in the U.S. in 2008 was evangelicals. Yeah. Um, you know, you name it retrograde um, reaction which involved a diminishing of the rights and value of lots of populations um, was a routine feature which then leads to the most searching questions about well what is it actually that is driving or was driving is driving this community and what does it have to do with Jesus and a lot of us have left because we're sure that it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus in fact Jesus Jesus would stand on the other side of a lot of, of, of what that movement has been about. Yeah, so whether it's your wording, whether it was dragging their feet, my wording, uh, late to the party, um, mm -hmm. what drove... Or n not going to the party, because yeah. you don't want to go to the party. Yeah, right, 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 not even <laughs> want to go. Um, yeah. Or think the party's even wrong. Uh, what... It, right. what, yeah. what was that was it biblicism was it biblical literalism what did it and did we i mean on some maybe on some things um <laughs> like on uh homosexuality uh the, the, you know they were quite sure that was ruled out biblically um so but on on feminism a lot of those arguments were biblical but um and how about militarism i didn't mention when there was a big fight over the legitimacy of the vietnam war most white evangelicals were on the pro-Vietnam War side, you know, and against the peace marchers in the streets and so on. When there was worry over the buildup of nuclear weapons that could annihilate the planet and conservative evangelicals positioned themselves with the cold warriors, you know, and not the peace activists. Um, after a while, you see such a consistent pattern that really all you have to ask is, in American cultural divisions, what are the progressives saying? The evangelicals would be on the opposite side, just by definition. Same with environment, by the way. There's no, there's no obvious, quote unquote, biblical reason why evangelicals should, should not believe in climate change or not care about it, or not worry about uh, clean water or, uh, or, you know, toxins in the soil. I mean, you think there'd be some pretty good reasons to care about that biblically. But when that became identified as a progressive issue, they were going to be against it. Which, again, leads to the, to the recognition that a lot of what 
ended up being the quote-unquote evangelical ethic was the politics, and the politics was borrowed from the right wing uh, of the Republican Party, and so there wasn't coherent uh, ethics. And all you really have to do is compare that posture to what uh, I teach from an Eastern Orthodox teaching document. It's over here. It's called For the Life of the World. I teach from this. And there's Roman Catholic teaching documents, too. Um, they are not able to be pigeonholed as consistently conservative or liberal because they're operating from a tradition that is older than our left-right binary and that will surprise you sometimes. So the Orthodox teaching document is very committed to environmental concern and to economic simplicity. They also happen to be conservative on, like, abortion. Okay? That's just where they are. But, but evangelicals didn't have that kind of teaching tradition that would keep them from just falling into whatever the right wing was saying at a given time. And so that's where the ethics came from, and that is part of the problem, a big part of the problem. Thank you.